All right, hello, welcome. My name is Melissa Basinger. I'm an instructional designer uh, here in the Academy for Teaching Excellence. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar event, which is part of Harper College Tech Week 2020. Uh, we are broadcasting um, over WebEx, and we're also conducting the event live in the Academy in F315. And we are recording this webinar for later viewing. So two events will be broadcast today. First is the presentation, Collaborative Tech and the Wicked Problem of Open Pedagogies, presented by guest speakers from Texas State University and Colgate University. Then after a break to transition, we'll continue with our Harper employee panel on what OER means to me. So for this webinar, all participants are muted when they join. So as long as you can hear me, uh, you're good to go. If you'd like to communicate with our presenters, you can post a message in the Q&A chat area. There will be a designated Q&A portion at the end of the webinar for the presenters to address your questions. And if you would like to check into the Tech Week Scavenger Hunt Challenge, you can use the QR code that appears on several of the slides um, or visit the link shown. And you can also find the QR code in the live viewing area. So very exciting. This webinar is being held in WebEx, which is new, and it's now available to all Harper employees at harpercollege.webex.com. So for more information, you can visit the Employee Technical Skills Training page on HIP. So at this time, I would like to extend a special welcome to Peter Shearhart, Associate Dean Honors College at Texas State University, Karen Hart, Professor of Geology at Colgate University, and Ahmad Kazahi, Director of Engagement and Support at Colgate University. So I'll let them um, provide a little bit of introduction. So on behalf of Harper College, I want to extend a very warm welcome to Peter, Karen, and Hamad. Ahmad, and I will now turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Melissa. We're really glad to be here. We're be here remotely, virtually, basically. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on where we're coming from with this presentation. We're a kind of an eclectic team. Um, we've been working together for several years on exploring different kinds of open pedagogies, um, trying to push the boundaries of conventional classrooms, and trying to work across a number of different con kind of conventional boundaries in the academic system. So, for instance, Peter, who's at um, Texas State, is now at a he started at Colgate, but now he's down at a um, large state school. So he's coming from a very different perspective from us at Colgate University, which is in upstate New York, and it's a small uh, liberal arts school that's undergraduate only. Um, Peter is, is the, uh, an associate dean at, in the Honors College at Texas State. So he walks the line between um, faculty and administrator and has a lot of experience in both of those categories. And he's also a musician by training. He's a doctorate in music. Um, Ahmad comes from the tech side of things. He's the director of engagement at Colgate and um, puts out fires on a minute by minute basis here. So he has the staff side and the support side of the perspectives to talk about here. And I'm on the conventional faculty end of things here at Colgate, um, where my background is in rock and geology. I work on volcanoes. So what we've gotten to do together is um, explore open pedagogy, experimental kinds of classrooms, and, and bring to it a bunch of different perspectives as trying to make these kinds of events happen. And that's what we'd really like to share with you today. So um, with no further ado, I'm gonna turn you over to Peter. All right, well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> You're probably wondering what, <clears throat> what is an open pedagogy anyway? It's in the title of the presentation. It's kind of a weird, use of terminology. And I think the short answer to that question is it's what you get when you have this unruly weird combination of people that uh, Karen just described, uh, you know, a musician, a geologist, and a math IT person with a geology background. Uh, we start to have weird conversations that take us in interesting directions and start to no notice new connections between um, concepts and ideas that maybe we hadn't noticed before. So for me as a musician in the group, Pondering this notion of open pedagogy takes me to a specific place and specific time. And I'm going to take you there today by way of the way, way back machine 
And the place we're going is the city of New York in 1963-ish. Uh, 1950s and 1960s were a pretty vibrant time in New York City. Uh, it was during this time that there was a loose group of artists and musicians working together and trying out new ideas. Kind of the, the old rules of, of art and creativity started to break down after the end of the Second World War. We saw a lot of new artistic practices begin to emerge. Um, some of these you will probably recognize uh, in, in art museums all around the world. Uh, people like Philip Guston, um, abstract expressionists, um, William de Koenig, probably most famously artists like Mark Rothko, um, began to experiment with new ways of painting, new ways of seeing, new ways, ex new ways of experiencing art. Um, arguably less well-known than the artists, the visual artists in the movement, uh, were composers like Morton Feldman and John Cage. Morton Feldman is actually pretty well known for his uh, intersections with Rothko. He wrote a famous piece called Rothko Chapel. It was composed for the Rothko Chapel in Houston. Uh, and John Cage is probably best known for his work on silence and music composition. He wrote a really famous work called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. It's basically all resting. There's, um, <clears throat> there's no music produced by the piano or any other instrument during that, uh, during that time period. It's all about the, the ambient noise of the environment and sound itself. Um, so these, these artists and musicians were actually working in a really tight circle with each other, rethinking formal relationships between um, you know, sight and sound and performance and, and interactivity with the audience. Um, Cage also did some work in early computer music, so <clears throat> he would uh, uh, use computers to generate random number sequences that would then uh, generate a composition that would, that would vary from performance to performance. Um, and this, this approach, this kind of openness to, to form and performance was something that really inspired Cage's students, and there are quite a number of them working in different artistic movements. Uh, one of the better known of Cage's students is Christian Wolff. Uh, Christian Wolff actually went on to be a classics scholar, uh, educated at Harvard, but um, studied with Cage during the 50s and 60s and wrote some really, really fantastic works of um, aleatoric music. Um, he kind of pushed things in a different direction. So Cage, in his work with numbers, number generators and silent music, was kind of working in the direction of what we've called indeterminacy of composition. So he was using indeterminate methods to generate a work that was more or less fixed in its final form. So it would generate a fixed score um, that could be interpreted differently. Christian Wolff was doing more of indeterminacy in performance. So he, he would create, create a single score that had multiple performance interpretations possible. Um, and he used unconventional no notation that ultimately led to pretty unpredictable outcomes during performance. So an example of that would be a piece like this. Uh, it's a page from a score from for one, two, or three people from 1964. All this is is random snippets of moments in time. And the notation that is non-traditional for the most part, there's some conventional dynamics, uh, some numbers that you can read, but what the, what the score is really telling you to do is to choose your own path through the score, uh, decide where you go next, and the, the individual marks tell you when to start playing or when to stop playing, what simultaneous events have to happen before you can play. So for instance, don't start playing a note until somebody else stops, or do your best to play this note simultaneously with somebody else playing their note. So it's, it's arranging for uh, new combinations to emerge through performance without actually predicting the sounds that you're going to hear. So for an audience member, it's always kind of exciting to, to hear a performance of this because you never know quite what you're gonna get. Um, there's, a, there, there's a thrill of living in the moment of composition, uh, or I'm sorry, in the moment of performance. So, this, this practice of experimenting with new forms and new relationships and performance has been described in any number of different ways by um, scholars in various fields. Uh, the Italian writer Umberto Eco uh, called it open work. Music theorist Thomas DeLeo called it open form. John Cage himself called it indeterminacy. And of course, that ends up with indeterminacy of composition or indeterminacy of performance. The conductor and composer Pierre Boulez called it aleatory. 
composer Karl Heinz Stockhausen called it mobile form, but whatever you call it, there are a few things that these works have in common. And it's the ability of a piece of music to be performed in substantially different ways. And as Umberto Eco said in the open work, it's like handing the notation to the performer more or less like the components of a construction kit. So you can kind of think of it like a box of Lego. In the old days, you know, Lego didn't have complicated instructions. You weren't building the Millennium Falcon or something. You know, you, you, as a kid, you got to decide what you were gonna make from this Lego. You knew, this, you knew the component pieces you had to work with. You knew that it was always going to be Lego, but you didn't know quite what you were gonna get at the end of it. Um, and that is very much what an open work is in spirit. So regardless of, of um, what, you, what you make of this, uh, this principle, this practice of open, open works, um, there are some interesting relationships to classroom pedagogy today. And to understand those, you have to get back in the time machine and go back to, go forward in time to the present day. And you may find yourself somewhere like this uh, in the lobby of the Stanford D School, circa 2017, mid-2010s. Mid um, Karen and I were both fortunate to uh, receive training through the D School, the teaching and learning studio that they offer for uh, teachers uh, and administrators. It was a very, very valuable experience. Um, and you may have heard about design thinking because it's generated a lot of publicity as a way to engage students in the learning process and a way to challenge them to address real world issues uh, or develop their creative skills or tackle, tackle wicked problems. Wicked problems are difficult to define problems with no straightforward solution. Um, it's also been championed as a way to rejuvenate teaching and learning. Uh, maybe it's even the new, the new liberal arts that's going to save liberal arts colleges, save liberal arts um, as an as a aspirational teaching goal. Um, but so whether it's the new liberal arts or not uh, kind of remains to be seen, but it has certainly brought new attention to what we would call open pedagogy. What we mean by that is design thinking outlines a general process. And if you read the Stanford literature, the process is empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Um, and it outlines associated competencies with those um, steps of that process. But within that, students act freely to develop projects of, projects of their own design. The outcome isn't clear. The instructors don't know what's going to result. And all the process really offers is a few guideposts that tell you when to do something or give you a range of possibilities for action within that framework. So seeing this kind of relationship between open and aleatoric composition of the 1950s and 60s in New York and the design thinking framework of the D School at Stanford, we, we kind of view open pedagogy as an approach to teaching in which the process is known, but the outcome is indeterminate. So, it's like working with Legos. You know you're going to get something at the end of it. You know it's going to be made of Legos, but the student has a lot of power to decide what that thing is. So what I always tell my students in my classes that are taught using open pedagogy and design thinking is that I bring the structure and the method, and you bring the ideas and the passion. And so I, as a teacher, become more of a, a curator. Um, I recede into the background. I coach their projects along, um, but I'm less concerned with uh, particulars of, of the project itself. Um, so it has, a, it has an open outcome, we would say. Um, so much as in the musicological and artistic concepts, uh, for, uh, sorry, context, this concept of an open pedagogy actually has any number of specific manifestations and uh, instances. Uh, a few of the terms you might hear are problem-based learning, project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, experiential learning, and there are others as well. But um, what, what these all have in common is this openness in form. So you, you get a structure, but you don't know exactly what you're gonna get at the end of the day. Problem-based learning was originally uh, developed in the medical field um, as a way to help train students to diagnose patients. So that you can see the obvious uh, implications there. You, you don't know the diagnosis before the patient walks into room. In, in the room, you have to figure it out and teaching students that process, that diagnostic process, is uh, really important. Project-based learning has all sorts of applications in the creative fields, um, like design, architecture, you know, build a building of a certain type, how it turns out is less clear, but you know you're gonna get a building at the end of it. So 
this this notion of open pedagogy uh, that has all of these these specific manifestations actually has a really rich history on its own. Um, so uh, one person who was involved in championing uh, early open pedagogies, we would say, is uh, John Dewey. Um, so we like to think we like to think that this is all new. It all came out of Stanford in the last five years. That actually John Dewey was talking about. Um, learner-centered education as early as the early 20th century. Um, so he wrote very famously uh, that the teacher and the book are no longer the only instructors. Um, and that was from 19, 1915 or so that he wrote that. So we, we keep having these conversations over and over and saying the same things over and over. Uh, so hopefully one day we can uh, get it to take hold. But this, this sounds really inspirational to us and it's very much the way we think of ourselves as educators. But many of the same problems that face open musical works uh, actually also face open pedagogies. So, uh, you know, in music, because the conductor and the composer kind of recede into the background and what becomes important is the, is the performer and the performance of, of an open score, you kind of lose the old power structures, you lose the old administrative structures. The same is true in open pedagogy. So the faculty member and the administration is a little bit less important and what becomes more important is the student. So uh, as a result of these shifts uh, and the complexities that result from the shifts, many people don't even bother trying open pedagogies. They're too complicated. They raise too many problems. The existing educational hierarchy um, really runs better on closed predictable pedagogies and not open wicked pedagogies. And that tension between doing what's good for students and society and what's good at the institutional level uh, is what, where we are ultimately going to turn our attention. And with that, I will, I will hand things over to Karen. So one of the, thanks, Peter. So one of the critical things to understand about um, why we try to explore notions of open pedagogy is the fact that um, these approaches really turn the focus of education on the student and it becomes student driven, student centered. Um, it really encourages the student to take control of their own education and to dive into the material as deeply as they can and want to do so. Um, the, it helps also gear the classroom or kind of pivot the classroom a little bit from um, into the space where students can see the connection between what they're learning in class and what they'll be able to use in their careers. Um, it, many of the skills that they learn in these classes or that they develop in these classes um, are ones that they can translate and carry immediately into the workforce, almost regardless of where they go. Um, the ability to take criticism in a constructive way, the ability to manage working on a team, um, things like enhancing their ability to be creative and their confidence in being creative. Many of the questions that we end up looking at in these kinds of classrooms are very interdisciplinary. Again, that's something that connects strongly to the um, student's potential future job because very few jobs are actually monodisciplinary in nature for the most part. Um, and it really gives students a, a sense of doing something that connects to the real world, uh, to, to the potential that make a difference in the real world and to prepare them for moving into that space from the academic space. Um, but it does bring with it a number of challenges. Um, the, the plus side is the students are legitimately really engaged. I can tell you just last night, I had an event related to our design class where students were working with senior citizens. The, their clients uh, came up to the presentation and I can tell you that the engagement level of the student, the excitement level of the students, and the energy in the room and the attention to detail that the students put into their projects was, was an order of magnitude higher than what you see when they're doing some assignment that you've simply generically assigned to them. So it, it really is a palpable difference. But like I said, the challenges are, um, we'll be going into those as we move forward um, once we lay out some examples of what we've been working with. So go ahead. Um, you're next, right? So this brings us to our next, uh, the next phase of the presentation, which is the audience choice uh, moment. And so if you didn't get a chance to scan the QR code, this is your chance to scan it. Um, because we've prepared four scenarios for you. Uh, we only have time to go into one of them. And so those scenarios 
It's, uh, it's a choose your own adventure. It is a choose, yes. It's a true to form. You have a little <laughs> say in what we're going to do. Um, so the very first, uh, for those of you that are ready to go, the very first um, scenario is a project at Colgate, um, the DLab project, where students get to build solutions for campus problems that they themselves identify. The second one, also from Colgate, is a student-driven problem-solving SPOT team. SPOT is in like, you know, the, the tactical team. So uh, we call them the innovation fellows. And then we have two from Texas State, uh, one designing um, a scholarly capstone project using design thinking, and another one is a project-based approach to the core curriculum. So go ahead and take a moment to cast your votes, uh, and then that'll dictate where the presentation goes next. Polls are open. You need Jeopardy music. I know. <laughs> Hey, there are people there. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, there's some competition there. <laughs> it's Texas State versus Colgate. Oh. <laughs> kind of like watching Iowa. Yeah. Awesome. So it looks like you actually... Any last minute votes? Last minute votes? Okay. We'll go looks with, like D-Lab uh, is the winner. Looks like D-Lab it is. So let's go to the D-Lab course. <clears throat> so the D-Lab course was an entirely project-based course using design thinking. Um, and so the design course for D-Lab was a, it started with grassroots origins. Um, and it's something where Peter, Karen, and I, uh, well, those two were running a scholars program. Uh, and then I got invited when they wanted to establish a capstone course program, uh, a capstone project for the program. And so instead of uh, doing it from top down, uh, we got together and designed an entirely extracurricular effort so that have the students use design thinking methods to craft the syllabus and then uh, come voluntarily for uh, once a week for the entire semester uh, to, in the evenings to engage in the process. So two, two interesting things happen here. First, every student saw the process through to the end, uh, and normally, as you probably all know, in volunteer situations, attendance tends to drop off very quickly. The second was that we did, in fact, merge with the very exciting project-based seminar course syllabus. Uh, the cornerstone of the course was that the students ultimately decided on the design challenge themselves. So here's where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, the capstone course uh, used a 15-week design thinking method. Uh, and it was entirely project-based and allowed the students to select the focus of their major project. Uh, it made it fully interdisciplinary. So it also was kind of like, where do we put this, the, where do we place this course? Uh, and so at Colgate, we, um, we're a liberal art, we have a liberal arts core curriculum. And that includes a class about science and its impact on society. So uh, we offered the new project-based course uh, with this big title of Emerging Global Challenges. Um, and then contacted the students as they enrolled and said, all right, here's, here's what's actually going to happen. Um, and so the, also, as you probably know, if you've uh, heard or experienced any design thinking, um, those activities require super long periods of time to, then, which is very different than like, okay, class is one hour. So what we had to do was offer the course in the evenings unofficially uh, uh, to accommodate those needs. And so um, we had three design projects for the course. The first one it was to introduce students to the process. It was a single class session, start to finish, design a simple idea for another student. So an exercise space, a study space, and things like that. The second was three to four weeks, and that involved finding a specific client. And so uh, we identified people who were interested in the program uh, and then paired those with students. And so then the students would interview the clients, um, understand the challenges, then design a potential solution for them. That's the one we're just finishing up now. Yep. And so, um, <clears throat> no, that's okay. The, the idea was that they would, uh, they would listen, they would propose a solution, iterate the solution, and then kind of just keep refining it. So we, uh, we provided things like 3D printers so that they could uh, create prototypes and other things along that lines. So um, someone designed a drumstick holder for musician, uh, a musician, a new system for sorting paperwork, uh, and we even had senior citizens at that moment in time too, uh, looking at accessibility uh, themes in terms of walk, um, how they, they navigate across campus. And then the last part of it was uh, uh, the big project that was signed to 10 weeks where the class selected a theme based on their interviews across campus and in the community to learn about uh, challenges that people were facing. Then in groups of four to five students, they further refined their design project idea uh, within, within that theme, 
and follow the process, the design thinking process to a potential solution, including multiple phases of, um, of uh, re, uh, reiterating their solution. So that is sort of the, that aspect of the, of the course. Um, the next phase, uh, and well, so today we actually offered this course three times, um, two had student selected themes. The first was how to improve innovation on campus. The, uh, the other one, uh, within that one, actually developed with proposals for revisions of the first year orientation, the mentoring, the new mentoring program, uh, makerspace design, um, and other mechanisms to encourage collaboration across uh, or between offices. <clears throat> um, the second was focused on uh, sustainability, so a lot of recycling and things like that. Um, and so the there, the students emerge with proposals for interactive websites for educating students about recycling, uh, put together a system to compost uh, food from the dorms uh, and get that to the community garden, and two types of systems for students to buy, sell, and trade items to minimize waste at the end of the year. Um, so, do you have a little more time to go on? Okay. okay. All right. So then, um, so what are the benefits or outcomes of this sort of thing? Well, so the first thing uh, that came up was that students remained engaged throughout the entire process, and not just kind of personally, but like super, super engaged. Um, and part of it, yeah, what we, you know, after sort of debriefing at the end of it, we attributed this to the highly dynamic and active nature of the class. Um, so the students had to, they had agency over what they were doing in, in, in the educational process. They chose their project. Uh, and they made critical decisions along the way. Um, and uh, I think in part two, this type of project attracted that type of student. So they remained energetic, enthusiastic, and motivated me through the entire process. Um, a nice side effect was that students had to actually flex their creative muscles. Uh, it's something that sort of, you might, you know, it's, it's a, not a new thing, the atrophy of this muscle given our current education system. Uh, it's like, okay, prep you for the test and move on. So this was a good chance for them to kind of flex that and, and develop it further. Um, the, students, the students also had to learn how to break out of the, the box checking mentality, kind of moving along those same lines. Um, and then they also learned that failure is okay. Uh, it's an opportunity to learn, to grow, um, and it was good for them to gain some resiliency from it. They also experienced a more realistic process uh, for completing the project. Uh, it's not your typical, I'm going to stay up late, write this paper. It's really my first draft, but I'm going to turn it anyway. Uh, so, because it doesn't, it, that doesn't work in this sort of scenario. Uh, so, you have to prototype, you have to test, you have to fix it, uh, test again, uh, and kind of figure out what, what that whole process is. So, they got to experience all of that, uh, which is, in our mind, a better transition into the workspace. And then students get to refine those abilities for that group. I mean, as Karen, as Karen just said, it's not a mono, uh, mono discipline. So, uh, that is what we found to be super beneficial coming out of this. All right, so we have another audience choice moment. And so now you get to choose between two things. Um, let's talk about resources. So obviously, uh, this sort of work, uh, this sort of open pedagogy approach does require a few extras. And so you get to choose between um, what it looks like for training and preparation or what, what the financials look like it. And so let's go to our code, or if you still have your phone active, it should um, let you choose another of oh, training and preparation, <laughs> 100%. Here we go. <laughs> and that also could be one vote, so we'll give it a sec, although it's not changing as quickly as the other one. <laughs> All right, let's just go with uh, training and preparation. Training and prep, all right. Training and prep it is. So uh, as we were just saying, uh, open pedagogy kind of puts a lot of strain um, on pretty much all parties involved. <laughs> so because um, it, it, you're not just prepping one thing, and it's not something that you prep um, six months in advance. So uh, the first thing you know, you start to realize what in, as it came up for us in this model was that no one really knew what tech was going to be available at any one given moment in time. So um, Last night, the students were working on ways to acquire data, data but, you know, did they have access to a color credit? Likely, yes. Were they going to have other samples of things to, to present uh, to their clients? That was a different story, right? So how they got it, so lots of uh, last-minute prep that happens because you're making decisions along the way, 
right? So training schedules don't match the, the course load all the time because you could be into a course and all of a sudden you're like, I need to learn how to use this new product. So when do you do that? Um, <clears throat> other needs arise in the middle of a project that you just don't anticipate because of just the way we're choosing, you're choosing your own adventure today, students choose your adventure and have to navigate from that. So some of the lessons we learned along the way was that uh, faculty have to verbalize and anticipate needs as best they can. Uh, IT on our end uh, needs to uh, become an expert in the market and be prepared to implement some ground support as quickly as possible. So how do you keep people nimble? And then start to reserve time in your schedule so that you can make these pivots along the way. Uh, and so these were just some of the uh, things that rose to the top for us as we went through this process. I don't know if Karen and Peter want to add a little bit extra. Well, one of the, one of the things we've noticed is that, that the, the IT, because we have to, as faculty, have to come to IT sometimes with a one day, two day request, notice request. Um, they don't have the bandwidth because you don't, you're so busy doing everything that you need to do to keep the, keep the business running. Um, but doing that is fundamentally unfair by us to you because their, their job definitions are so tightly integrated with each other. That there's no room for that to accommodate the last minute requests, last minute um, pivots in terms of what they're doing with their day or, or something like that. So rethinking how someone's day is defined to allow for that bandwidth to exist is a really critical, although it's a very challenging thing to do. We're just too tight. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I would add, I would uh, third that as well, because we live in a society that, that values busyness. And if you're not busy, then you're not important. Or if you're not busy, you're not good at your job. But a lot like in open works of music, um, being busy is sometimes the enemy of success. You need to be able to observe your surroundings and interact with it effectively. Um, and so the more busy you are in an environment where people are using open teaching methods, uh, the less likely you are to be successful. And as a result, people are going to think, well, that's, that's not a great way to teach. It doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't have the support it needs. Um, so, so you kind of have to shift your values, which is very hard, um, institutionally speaking. Um, so with that, we have your third audience choice moment, um, and it is time for you to choose uh, between these three topics, uh, IT classroom boundaries, institutional inertia, and the little and ironic hypocrisies that we all need to that come, come with, that open come, with that come with open pedagogy. So, uh-oh. <laughs> It's fun to see the chart move, at least from our end. Okay, I think we're going to go with institutional. Oh, 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 wait, hold it, hold it. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. We <laughs> need one vote. Not going to happen. So, there oh, we go. Okay. We're going <clears> with. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Peter, pick one. Yeah. Well, let's see. It? IT and classroom boundaries seems like it's a, it's a winner right now, so we'll go with that. So um, every institution, as as you all know, and probably speak with your colleagues, is is very um, has very very different sets of guidelines. So when Peter Karen and I worked uh, at Colgate together, it was a very like we figured it out. It, we figured out a way for us to work together, and it was great. Uh, and then Peter went to Texas State, and his uh, hurdles that he had to overcome were very different. And so it's fun for us to sort of catch up and figure out what those are. But some things that are sort of remain constant for us were that uh, open pedagogy can be, well, the problem is that it can be used in a number of disciplines. So sometimes trying to say, just as our course, uh, where do we put it? Um, you kind of have to be a little bit flexible there. So. The, another problem was that staff uh, aren't always considered as educators, right? There's some institutions uh, when we talk with our colleagues, it's like, yeah, you can bring a staff member, they can uh, receive compensation or get an allotment to help co-teach a course or some segment of a course. It's not that we, we can't do that here. Sort of, it's a, it's a, will you support me? Yes or no? And I'm going to bring you some cookies um, to make it work. So, or um, is is the design uh, the the classroom design can actually be insufficient? So we talk a lot about sort of space space design and how um, is the space conducive to do what you want to do? Uh, and sometimes you have really nice furniture and you still don't use it that way. Other times you just gotta you're you're just in a room or in a field. It really depends. 
Um, so some things that we learned from it are um, faculty do need IT technological expertise, um, but it's an open dialogue. It's not just like, come, come consult and tell me what I need. It's, it's got to be back and forth. Um, we need to allow IT staff or other staff members to, uh, to, to be in a space where they can create teaching opportunities. Um, because if it's not for a uh, core component to, to the curriculum, it's something that carries on to that next phase of their life, whether it's a skill that they can use in other classes uh, or a skill they can use in, in the next phase of their career. Um, and then there's also, uh, can we do something a little bit different than we normally do with, with the classroom space? Um, and I, I say that purely because every time the class uh, comes up again, it's always like, where can we do it again on campus? And then is it going to be any different? Or what are the, the new limitations there? So um, branching a little bit out of that, out of that mentality and methodology is always helpful. Peter, you want to comment? Uh, yeah, I would say that um, the staff not being treated as educators is a, is a huge, huge problem. And I think it relates to the medieval hierarchy that, you know, is the foundation of the modern university that, you know, there are people who teach and who are experts in their field and then there are people who just are support. But really what open pedagogy teaches us is that, is that everybody's involved in the process and everybody has a role to play and that those, those hierarchies just really are unproductive um, and, you know, <laughs> unhelpful at the very least. Um, and, and in fact, if you wanted to even step step back from open pedagogy, you, you would realize that there are teachable moments in pretty much every interaction that happens on a campus where, you know, you should be teaching students how to interact with service people, how to make requests for um, support services, um, how to interact with people in offices. You know, there are teachable moments all over campus all the time, um, even though we don't always treat our staff as, as educators. But open pedagogy is a really fantastic opportunity to highlight the teaching role that our staff and our technical personnel can play in supporting, um, in supporting our students and really helping them to see the applicability of their ideas in the real world. And then the uh, thing I was going to throw in about classroom technology or classroom design is that we, um, at least at, at Texas State, and I have wonderful colleagues, but um, sometimes we'll buy a whole classroom full of new furniture and it's, it's supposedly the active learning furniture, it's the best stuff on the market, and then we set it up in rows and we teach lecture classes and we do nothing differently with it. So it's highly possible that we could actually uh, create some of the changes we need in classroom design just by setting up our rooms differently and just by encouraging our faculty to teach uh, in a different way using what we already have. So we're not talking about spending thousands and thousands of dollars necessarily on new furniture. We're just asking people to think about using what we have in new ways. Aaron, anything else on your end? We're good. Let's keep going. All right. Back to you. And I think. So, um, what we've been trying to do with this presentation is um, give you a little bit of firsthand experience with the open pedagogy process in the sense that you had some agency in where this talk was going. Um, you had some choices to make. We could talk about some of the issues that you selected. And, and we consider that a big plus side to things. And it's only a minor example, admittedly, um, but it is nevertheless an illustration of having some control over what you're actually experiencing, which is what we're trying to do for the students. Um, we also wanted to give you a sense of the fact that it, there aren't necessary, we talk about all these hurdles and we've just gone through this whole section talking about the challenges, which in some cases require wholesale cultural changes on campus, um, at least they do here <laughs> in some ways. Um, but, but you can do lots of little things that help enhance the potential to use open pedagogy approaches in the classroom. Um, tiny things like using poll everywhere when you want to try and get students' opinions on what you can do. And those can make big differences in little ways for how the students sense that they own what's going on in the classroom and for them to feel like they have agency in the process. Um, the, the downside, of course, of this whole experience when you try to, to leave it open for students to, to work their way through concepts um, in smart and intelligent ways where you're the guide instead of the, the promoter or the distributor of knowledge, so to speak. And that's that you have to anticipate as many different aspects of the, 
events that can take place in the classroom. So for instance, we, in constructing this Make Your Own Adventure presentation, we, we could give it in a number of different ways, but we had to prepare something on the order of three or four times as much material as we'll even talk about today. Because we didn't know what you'd choose, we didn't know what you'd be interested in, and we wanted to give you options to do that. So there's a downside from the prep side, um, but the upside is very much that, that it is, I mean, I've been teaching for 20 years, or more than 20 years, and I've tried lots of different experiments in the classroom, very project-oriented, focused very much on sort of real-world application. But until I started working with Peter and Ahmad and dialing this up kind of to 11, so to speak, um, and, and going wholesale into this process, and I'm not trying to sound like I'm proselytizing in any way, um, it really is a sea change in the, in the commitment of the students to what they're doing when they can see how what they're doing is connected to the real world, pays off in the long run in terms of skills that they'll be able to use in the future, because that's what they're thinking about. Their parents are talking to them about what are you going to do after school? How is reading this book going to help you? Reading the book could help you, but reading the book and then learning how to explain it to someone else will also really help you in the future. Um, giving students this confidence that they're able to handle complicated problems, long-term projects, is also something that's really going to help them um, move through in the future. And then as a result, the payback is that they're really much more engaged. So hopefully this kind of low-level open pedagogy experience at least gave you a whiff of what we're trying to convey here. So what we'd like to do now is move into um, the Q&A session. In case anyone has some questions you'd like to talk about, um, we have some questions up here that were ideas that might be potential topics you might like to discuss. Um, Peter, do you have those questions? There they are. I do, yes. Um, we'll just post them here and give everyone a moment to look at them. We don't need to talk about these, but um, hopefully we've put out enough concepts that are worth discussing that you can lob some questions at us and we can turn this into more of a discussion and less of us um, being talking heads. Thank you so much. This is Melissa again. I'll put my video. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Um, so thank you so much for the presentation. Yes, we'll move into Q&A. So if you're participating um, online, you can type any questions into the um, Q&A portion there. I'm back. <laughs> uh, into the Q&A area. Um, and then if you want to see one of the questions, thanks for providing some prompt questions. Uh, just type one of those in if there's one that you're interested in. Um, to kick things off, I did have one of our online attendees. Um, they were really interested in those ironies and hypocrisies. Did you want to mention just one or two of the things that maybe were down that path we could have chosen that you particularly would uh, want to share? We could definitely do that. Peter, you want to take the lead on this one? Sure. I, I can pull up that slide, too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so one of the problems we've seen in, in education generally um, is how we teach students to act as agents in the, in the real world, um, let alone be user-centered. Um, how do we teach them to be tolerant of risk? Um, you know, we, we, are, we're, we claim to teach them how to, you know, think critically and creatively and write well and all of those sort of things, but those aren't necessarily the same skills that allow you to be, uh, you know, a, a really effective um, employee or business owner or job creator, or any of those sort of things that require you to think about risk and, and tolerate uncertainty um, in ways that the typical classroom environment just doesn't. Um, and then again, kind of like we mentioned earlier, some, some universities are really restrictive about who can be considered an instructor. And when in fact people in IT may be the best people to teach uncertainty and tolerance of risk, um, they're the ones putting themselves on the line whenever a faculty member can't turn the projector on, and that's a, that's a pretty big risk from what I've seen. So some of the lessons we've learned um, is, again, to empower this collaboration between faculty and IT. Um, you know, faculty aren't, aren't always the most technologically savvy, and IT staff don't always have access to classrooms in the ways that they should, and so building a better collaboration between them sends an important message to students about um, about how the real world works and how collaboration works um, and shows them, shows them how it works rather than just tells them how it works. 
and again, we, we just we say this over and over again. We, we have to learn to treat IT professionals as educators, um, and we have to, have to adapt the way we incorporate um, technology in our classrooms as if they are educators. So they're not just some resource on the outskirts of campus or somebody who can help you connect with your email or when you, you know, somebody you call when the Wi-Fi doesn't work. This is, this is part of the educational process. It's a, a way of teaching students to operate in an uncertain world. And uh, it's, it, it's something that, you know, lectures and multiple choice tests just don't really do a very good job with. Well, and, Karen, and do you want to add anything? Yeah, one of the other hypotheses or, or challenges that you're up against within the educational system is the students have come up through a system where you do your work, you get a grade, um, it's due by a certain deadline, and, and that is how they operate it. They're hardwired to do that, um, understandably. So, I, I mean, I can give you an example of, of the issue here. For instance, one of this, a pair of this, a group of students who's working with clients, um, a senior citizen working with her to develop a project. They're into week four of this project. Um, they had to do a presentation last night of sort of the nearly finished version of their project for an audience of clients, literally. And what happened with this particular group, they were doing due diligence, doing their work. Everything was sort of following the guided process, and they ran into a snag. They couldn't, because of um, illness and someone else's schedule, something out of their control, they couldn't speak with a stakeholder related to their idea, which involved a wellness center in town. And it turned out that the idea they took to them, not tenable, wasn't going to work. And so all of a sudden, I have this group of students, very diligent, hardworking students, who have nothing finalized to present that night. And so they're in a complete panic because they're trying to figure out how to do this. And I have to figure out how to walk the line between the fact that I will have to grade them which is that one of the hypocrisies in this system, at some, or one of the ironies really in the system, uh, because we want them to fail, but you can't give them an F for what they're doing. Um, and I need to reassure them that, that this failure is legitimate. They had to find out that this project wasn't tenable at the Wellness Center. It was critical to the success of their project. It was a really important milestone. And so we sat, sat down together and we thought about how they could use the presentation to their advantage to move their project forward. And so instead they did a, a canvas the audience with a bunch of ideas. They took a step back, looked at their original um, data that they gathered and, and learned a lot from the audience about where they might go with their idea. And, and what you can't do is penalize them for the fact that that didn't work out because they were doing exactly what they needed to do to move the project forward. They're so finding mm -hmm. that line between Students thinking they need to be graded a certain way, relieving that, and then not using it against them in some way, but then someday you have to give them a grade. Is a space that's, that's kind of challenging to navigate in this space. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Learning learning how to grade process instead of outcome is almost against every every rule we're taught <laughs> as kids. You know, like did you get the question right? Is not what we're great, you know, we're not grading on that. We're grading on did you follow the process? Did your did your idea grow and develop and change and adapt to things you learned along the way? That's what matters, and that's harder to grade for sure. Right, and, and if there was a way to get through education without having to force this this artificial connection between a grade and what the students are doing, like how to translate that or walk across that gap is tough. Well, I think even trying to um, bridge that at all goes back to a point you said in your presentation about this more mirrors what students would be doing in the workplace or in the real world, you know, where you're going through a process and there isn't like a grade at the end, your performance as you go through and how you work with your colleagues, that's a big part of what matters in getting things accomplished. So. I told that makes so much sense that the, <laughs> because we're in the educational environment, there can be some of these snags or, you know, being tied to, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Now, then there's, there's most you just think of this, which is really relevant, but the other issue is that, you know, in the real world, you have a project to get done, you have to get it done, right? It's your job to finish it by whenever it has to get done. Here, they're juggling, you know, three or four other classes at the same time, you know, they're, they're not only working on your class. 
So you have to be reasonable about that as well in terms of time. And if they get a, you know, a last minute curveball for their project and have to do a bunch of work to make up for it, you have to find a way to compensate for that and to, to accommodate the, the pressures on their schedule. So it doesn't impact their other educational obligations, which aren't going to be flexible necessarily. Um, and so you do end up in a, in a, in a funny space that way because you be, have to become the adaptable class because you can be um, and the nature of the process requires that but you're telling it, it becomes an issue of priority so students one of the challenges we we hit in this kind of a class is that because the work is not typical of the rest of their classes it doesn't have an exam with a deadline it doesn't have it does have deadlines but um, they don't feel the same urgency for these as they do for a conventional exam. That sometimes the work in the design class gets put off to last, and they they deal with the more conventional work that they're used to doing. And so it sometimes you do have to have these conversations with students that says, no, no, you going out and having five conversations with people to interview them about your project is the same as you studying for this other class. And there is a major sort of paradigm shift that the students have to do in their heads to realize that that work is equal to the other work they're doing in their class. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. yeah absolutely. Thank you. Um, Thank we you. have another question from um, one of our live attendees. They're asking uh, if you can expand another request on one of the options on the institutional and in, institutional inertia idea. So if you just touch on that a little bit. Sure, I can take it there. Uh, so, in terms of institutional inertia, what we were thinking is that, is that, you know, every campus has a strategic plan and every department has seats that need to be filled and, and a certain curriculum that has to be offered. Um, and so working with those existing silos and those um, existing constraints can be a real challenge because it's not always clear how open pedagogy fit into them. Um, and again, we find it's often really difficult to, to collaborate with staff as faculty members because staff have their own assignments and their own responsibilities um, that are driven by their strategic plans that are overseen by their bosses. Um, so the, the thing we, we use sometimes is that the ship is carried by the tide and it's difficult to steer. You know, it just kind of has its own, own momentum. And um, as change makers trying to work within that structure, it can be, can be very frustrating. And really the people who we're cheating are are our students who um, are confronting a completely different educational and work landscape than, than what was available 20 years ago. Um, you know, high cost of tuition, uncertain job markets, all those sort of things, and, and we're not doing a good job adapting to that. And yet the institutions are also hard to move. And then on top of that, there's all the accreditation problems that go along with it. Uh, whenever you start dealing with accreditation and assessment, it's a whole other layer of, of inertia that you have to deal with. So what have we done to try and manage these things? Uh, you know, Karen has mentioned a few of them already. Is start small, um, find some faculty who want to run experiments. Um, it so happens that Karen and I both love running experiments. We try and run experiments together as much as we can. Um, we do them in the classroom. We do them outside of the classroom. We try and find um, willing students first. And then we try and find willing departments or little spaces where we can operate with some flexibility um, that, that won't get anybody into trouble, but um, finding willing participants is really, uh, really key. And then play on your strengths, find what you're good at. Um, you know, if you, it, it just so happens that I'm a musician and Karen's a geologist, but maybe you have somebody who's um, working in architecture design or um, creative writing or something like that. There are all sorts of interesting um, possibilities that emerge when you find people with different sets of skills and different interests and you combine them to, to develop projects and, and frameworks, uh, contexts for students to play around with. Um, so another, another kind of strength though is institution that you are. So uh, Karen also mentioned this, that um, you know, Colgate's a small place, it's a small campus, um, it's kind of organizationally nimble, but everything is very political. Um, I can tell you <laughs> most campuses that are small like that, it's like, Everyone has um, everyone has a, a little piece of the a, an interest in every solution or every new initiative that's tried. Um, so it can be very difficult to get something launched at a campus level, even though it's a small institution. And at large institutions, we're really complicated. 
there's some redundancy. There's all, you know, everyone's always trying to reduce the level of redundancy uh, on campus. But because it's large and because it's complicated, you can often get away with trying things on a really small scale without anybody noticing. So you have to adopt a different experimental strategy depending on what campus you're, you're on, the nature of the campus, the politics of the campus. Um, and you may not be able to completely reach, reshape the, uh, the strategic plan, but you can certainly uh, create some, some inroads um, that may, maybe you can redirect a course, maybe you can get something added to the curriculum, something like that. Karen, do you want to add anything? Yeah, and there's there's something to be said for um, you know lots of baby steps, as Peter just referenced. So, for instance, um, getting the design class set at Colgate, despite us being small and and technically a little bit nimble, our curricular structure is not particularly nimble. So I started that class by by just changing the way an existing class was already taught. Um, the pedagogical structure of it, not so much the content. And then, and then it trying that a few more times, being able to justify it. I, I literally took that class and mapped it against the requirements of certain liberal arts core curricula, so that I could prove that we were doing what was required in those courses, despite the very different appearance of the class um, from the outside. And, but the notion that that once it's happened a few times. That inertia kind of plays in your favor because you can you can say well we just did this we've done it a few times and it's worked and and then you can get a little more traction on it it becomes kind of de facto oh that's the design class that's what they do even though you never officially declared that you were going to start it so kind of the gradually working you know dipping your toe in and eventually people start to go oh well that's it's always been like that hasn't it and even though it hasn't it plays in your favor a little bit so for instance, for this class, Ahmad mentioned this earlier, we work much better in the open pedagogy approach for the design class um, with big chunks of time so students can really dig into what they're working on, really dig into their data, think about it hard, pivot and so forth. Um, and we're not supposed to be teaching first and second year courses as seminars in the evening once a week. Um, we tried that a few times kind of off the record, off the books, but then I could prove that it worked okay, I could prove from surveys with the students that this was a good space, a good system for them, worked well for them. And then I took this to the powers that be and got, you know, special dispensation to teach the classes in space. Um, but I had to prove it. And I kind of had to try, run the experiment a few times before I could actually prove it to them. So there's a lot of sort of cart before the horse a few times in order to get it to work. But once you get it there, it becomes embedded in the system, which helps a little bit. The, the other step yeah. to build on that uh, was, the openness <clears throat> that at least when this started of like here were all the hurdles here's where we just couldn't get over them and here's where we succeeded and had huge successes um, so a lot of these courses ended up with a sort of similar to your tech week a sort of a, a tech garden presentation of um, here's what each group yeah. has come up with and in those presentations you know every group showcased you know here's what we did here were the struggles here were the, here were the huge wins for this particular project um, and the first time, uh, they, were, they were great. You invite a whole bunch of campus partners to, uh, to see it, and um, it out. the word gets out very quickly. And in, in, I, I think I referenced it, uh, or one, someone referenced it a little bit earlier, um, part of the core curriculum redesign. Uh, there were division directors that attended that were like, we need to meet with these students because there's a lot of valuable information here. And so uh, the surveys, the data they collected, is now playing a part in, in upcoming decision making. Um, and in the same token, uh, other professors who attend have reached out and said like, hey, can we collaborate on this particular class? We wanna, whether it's a small component or a bigger section of class. And so you start to build even further interdisciplinary uh, connections. And so just wanted to add to that. Yeah, well, and at the risk of piling on, I have uh, on a different slide, the core component requirements for our creative arts curriculum. This is kind of following up on what Karen said about trying experiments to see what works and um, integrating new pedagogies into existing classes. So as we were developing a new creative arts course here in the Honors College, we opened up the core requirements and we saw, you know, that um, th there's nothing that says in here how you teach. It only tells you what students need to be able to do by the end of the core course. And so we said, well, there's no reason that, that project-based learning can't be used to, the, to teach students um, 
uh, critical thinking or communication skills. In fact, it's extremely, extremely good at those things because of the uh, project-based assignments that students have to do. So it, this is my way of encouraging you to look at what the actual requirements are, not necessarily your own campus's interpretation of those state requirements, but what are the actual requirements and does open pedagogy give you a pathway into experimenting in those areas? Because it, it very well might. Yeah, it helped us a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, really they're not piling, but maybe pivoting uh, <laughs> into requirements. A lot of the examples that we've uh, presented today are just by nature of the fact that of who we are. So, uh, just to address Amy's question in the chat, um, the same thing has happened with librarians and other projects that we've had. So, for example, um, Professor Harp, IT and a library person. Um, so, so library and IT co-hosted a um, a data to dome presentation, and so that was a huge interdisciplinary push. Um, and so, but at the same time, the innovation fellows gave a series of, of workshops and exercises uh, for the participants of the dome. So uh, there are plenty of opportunities to. Uh, <clears throat> And we've said with IT, but it's pretty much any support campus partner that's out there. So in our, our examples have been IT just because I'm from the IT realm, but it's not limited to IT. I hope that answers Amy's question. Oh, that's fabulous. Um, I, we're out of time. I feel like we could talk. <laughs> I feel like no, we could you. talk forever. This has been fabulous. Um, I really want to um, thank you so much for presenting today. Um, I'm really glad to hear that one of my questions is about collecting data and hearing what the students have to say. It sounds like you're doing that. I'm awesome that this, this is showing you know benefits as well as meeting those outcomes like you were showing Peter. I think this is just a fabulous thing for um, faculty, IT, library, other collaborators to think about all and in all organizations. Um, so I wanna thank you all very much for your presentation today. Um, and for our Harper viewers, uh, we are recording this webinar, so we're gonna make this available on HIP and the Academy for Teaching Excellence webpage. I also really wanna thank our Tech Week uh, committee, the planning committee uh, that made this Tech Week possible and helped bring these three fabulous presenters um, to our campus. To, or well, to their their work virtually <laughs> to our campus today. Um, and so at this point, um, we will say goodbye to Peter and Karen and Ahmad. Um, if anyone has any further questions for them, you can let me know and I can try to get in touch with them. Um, Happy to have work with Thank you very much. And yeah, thank so, you for having us. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You so much thank you, everybody. Bye.